my name is uh, Ricardo Goodwin, and uh, I will be presenting this uh, work, uh, From Signals to Knowledge and From Knowledge to Action, Person Semiotics and the Grounding of Cognition. Um, this is a work that I have been developing together with uh, Eduardo Camargo, which is also uh, present here today, um, which is a postdoc uh, researcher uh, in our lab. And uh, well, the idea is uh, we are trying to, to work with uh, PERS uh, for mo now more than 25 years. And since the first time that uh, I got in contact with, with PERS, I had this impression or this idea that uh, Persian uh, philosophy and specifically Persian semiotics could be uh, a very nice uh, thing to be incorporated into the fields of intelligent systems and, and uh, artificial intelligence in, in general. So uh, up to now, we have uh, discovered, or, or at least we have got some ideas that uh, I would like to, to, to share. And that's the, the main reason for, for, for this talk, OK? Well, uh, if you go to the field of philosophy of mind, uh, we know that uh, philosophy of mind tries to solve some uh, questions that uh, are there uh, since a long time, maybe uh, since the, the time of Socrates and, and the, the classical philosophers, that are how the mind works, what happens inside the mind, or uh, how mind elements relate to, to the real world. And uh, well, these, these things are, are being discussed in, in the philosophy of mind since a, a very long time. And uh, it contributed a lot to the development of artificial intelligence. But artificial intelligence is not exactly the same thing as, as philosophy of mind, because artificial intelligence is more related to the development of computational algorithms that uh, that could be inspired by different uh, theories on how mind works and, and basically some of them coming from philosophy of mind, but not only uh, philosophy of mind. So uh, then we have uh, cognitive science that uh, are, is providing uh, scientific theories trying to explain the mechanisms of cognition, which in some sense are more or less the same thing uh, uh, that philosophy of mind is doing. In, in fact, we can see cognitive science as the integration of, of many different uh, fields. So uh, we, get, we got uh, uh, contributions from philosophy of mind, from artificial intelligence, from neuroscience, from psychology, from linguistics and, and social sciences. And uh, the basic uh, uh, field of interest is, is how to understand uh, the um, this topic of cognition, how cognition works, okay? And uh, if we take a look on, on what is cognition, uh, we could say that cognition is the process happening inside the mind, which collects data from the world using sensors, transforms this data into knowledge, and based in this knowledge and in the eternal agent's goals, uh, generates a sequence of actions affecting the world by means of actuators. So uh, basically, uh, cognition is the process that is happening inside the mind, okay? And if you go to the, uh, to the literature, uh, we will see that there are many different models of cognition. So uh, we need to, to have a difference between cognition, the phenomena, cognition is something that is happening in the human mind, and uh, what are the different models that people created about how this process of cognition happens, okay? So we could say that uh, models of cognitions are theories of possible ways in which cognition might be happening in natural minds, okay? Uh, they can be used in order to generate artificial agents. And uh, so we can uh, get these models of cognition to work in the field of artificial intelligence, okay? So uh, these models of cognitions, they have inspiration in many branches of cognitive science. We have models of cognitions coming from philosophy of mind. We have 
uh, models of cognition coming from artificial intelligence, models of cognition coming from neuroscience, and uh, models of cognitions coming from psychology, linguistics, social sciences, and, and, and all the, the, the different sciences that are a part of cognitive science. Okay. And uh, well, uh, if you go, for example, for cognitive psychology, um, cognitive psychology tries to model what happens inside the mind uh, as uh, three different uh, kinds of modules, perception, cognition, and action. Okay. Um, so we have the world, we have something that is sensed uh, from the world, then we perceive something, and then this goes to cognition, so, such that cognition is something that happens in, happening in, 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 in the mind, and then cognition decides something, and then uh, it goes to actions, and, 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 and then go to actuators and back to the world, okay? Um, well, we can see here that perception cognition and action in this model uh, are separate things. And this is not how I myself and, and some others uh, understand cognition. So this is not what we are going to do uh, in, in our uh, vision of, of how things work. We, we prefer to have uh, an understanding of cognition that includes perception and action. So uh, in, in our understanding of, of cognition, cognition is the whole process that incorporates perception and incorporates action too, okay? Uh, this is not uh, common sense for, for everyone. Uh, some people uh, like this, this idea of cognition of us incorporating everything. Some people don't. So I understand that uh, some people will not uh, like that, that view. But this is how we are going to, to, to approach uh, cognition, okay? And uh, another important uh, uh, element in this model is, is the presence of knowledge because cognition in some sense and, and perception uh, uh, get information from sensors and creates this knowledge. Uh, and then this knowledge could be used in some sense to derive actions and those actions are going to go through actuators and then uh, uh, act in, 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 in the world, okay? And so this is the main idea of, of our talk. Okay, we want to talk about uh, a model of cognition that is based on Persian semiotics, okay? And uh, well, if it's the case, uh, it's important to introduce Perse, I, I know that some of you uh, already know PERS and, and, and uh, uh, know a little bit or maybe a lot of, of uh, uh, his theory. But PERS was an American philosopher uh, that was born in 1839. He died in 1914. He is known as the father of semiotics uh, because there are more than just one semiotics. I, I put here Persian semiotics, just to make a, a differentiation. And he's also uh, the father of uh, a philosophical movement in, in North America that is called pragmatism, okay? And it's interesting to, to listen what some people told about Peirce. For example, Bertrand Russell uh, has said that Peirce was one of the most original minds of the later 19th century and the, certainly the greatest American thinker ever, okay? Popper said that uh, Peirce was one of the greatest philosophers of all times. Okay. And uh, well, uh, of course that there is a pragmatism, but in, in, in this particular case, we are interested in semiotics, which is basically the study of signs and sign processes. Um, and uh, a lot of people have tried to use a person a semiotics uh, uh, in, in different fields and particularly in, in artificial intelligence. And uh, in fact, person semiotics is a, a very sophisticated and, and complex uh, theory uh, with deep philosophical commitments. But one of the biggest problems of, of using and trying to, to, to benefit from this theory is that, uh, who knows Peirce knows that uh, Pearson semiotics uh, has a, a very strong technical terminology that is very different from everything else. 
And uh, to properly understand a person's semiotics, uh, it, it is required a, a great effort of abstraction uh, in order to be uh, properly understood because uh, person semiotics is not easy. Okay, so uh, what I am trying to do here is a kind of a Herculean uh, uh, task because I, I will try to explain a little bit of these uh, terminological ideas that are not mine but are from Peirce and uh, uh, it, it will be quite different. So I hope I can uh, give to you at least uh, uh, some hint on, 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 on these ideas and how they can be used to ground cognition as I have promised to, to, to say uh, at the beginning. Okay, before entering into Peirce, uh, it's interesting to talk about uh, different philosophers that have struggled with this uh, challenge of trying to, to uh, explain the elements that appears in the mind and trying to categorize those elements in, in, in different categories. And historically, uh, we have, for example, Aristotle that had proposed 10 basic categories for the things that appear in mind. And uh, Aristotle used uh, classes of words in order to, uh, to propose these categories. So substance, quantity, quality, relative, somewhere, sometime, being in a position, having, acting, and being acted upon uh, are the 10 basic categories that Aristotle proposed for just uh, categorizing the, the kinds of things that appear in, in, in a human mind. Uh, Kant, Kant has proposed a, a different set of categories. Kant has proposed 12 basic categories, uh, three for each of four modalities. And Kant used a different kind of, of, of uh, procedure for making this categorization. Uh, he tried to make this categorization based on the different kinds of judgments that the human mind could be uh, doing. Okay, so he talks about quantity, unity, polarity, totality, quality, reality, negation, limitation, relation, inherence, and subsistence, causality, and dependence, community, and modality, possibility, existence, necessity. And then, first, working on Kant categories. Uh, was able to reduce these 12 categories in three basic categories. And uh, differently from Kant and from Aristotle, Peirce uh, used it as a, a method for uh, trying to, to, to propose these categories, uh, the different kind of connectivity that ideas would have in, in our mind. And, and based on this idea that uh, these ideas can have different kinds of connectivity between with other ideas. Uh, he proposed three different categories that are uh, quite uh, difficult to understand for those that are not used to, to, to purse, uh, which is uh, firstness, secondness, and thirdness. So I, I try to explain a little bit about what are those categories. And uh, if, if I can succeed, maybe you can have at least an idea of, of uh, what these categories are about, okay? So uh, the first category of firstness is defined uh, by Peirce as the mode of being of that which is set as it is positively and without reference to anything else. So the idea of firstness uh, is related to many different ideas like uh, potentiality, originality, possibility, independence, randomness, chance, random actions, a feeling not yet converted to reflection, just a glimpse of the reality in the state of pure indetermination. So a firstness is something that appears from nothing, okay, and just appears in our mind and uh, it's, it's basically the, the, the idea of firstness, something that is not connected to, to, to something else, okay? Let's try to, to use that for now. Secondness, the second category from Peirce, 
is the mode of being of that which is such as it is with respect to a second, but regardless of any third. So uh, basically, secondness is an idea that depends on an other idea. So instead of ideas of firstness that are, are full in, in, in themselves, uh, in the idea of secondness, uh, this idea should require some other idea. For example, uh, let's try to understand the idea of below, okay? I can't understand below without asking, below what? You know, because the whole idea of below requires that uh, I need to have a second idea in order to understand this idea of below, okay? Uh, this is an, an example of, of uh, an idea of, of secondness, okay? Um, so secondness is related to our experience on current space-time, actuality, reactive actions, cause-effect, relationships, experiential reality to the actual facts, the perceptive consistence without purpose or judgment yet, a binary relation, a Cartesian pair, all those ideas are instances of uh, ideas of, of secondness, okay? And finally, uh, it's interesting because uh, here uh, you can see that I have uh, an idea connected to another idea. And the idea of thirdness happens when this connection between these two ideas starts to become an idea in itself. Okay, so when I have secondness, I have one idea connected to other, and I don't think too much about this connection. But now, if this connection is important, then there comes the idea of thirdness. The mode of being of that, which is such as it is in bringing a second and third into relation to each other. And the interesting thing is that the idea of thirdness is related to a lot of things, mediation, law, habit, thought, continuity, purpose, judgment, the own idea of representation to the own idea of sign itself, okay? Um, it's, it's, it's really hard for someone that is seeing those ideas for the first time to, to make sense of, of all those ideas because the kind of abstractness that uh, we have embedded in these ideas of firstness, seconds, and thirdness is something that uh, takes a lot of time for people to, to, to fully meditate and understand, wow, why mediation is thirdness? Why um, uh, habit uh, uh, is, is thirdness? Why sign is, is thirdness? Uh, this is difficult to, to, to understand, and that, that is one of the difficulties in trying to, to use uh, Persian ideas to, to, um, to put in use in, in, for, for trying to, to ground cognition. But let, let's try to see if I can succeed, okay? Well, uh, as I said, the idea of thirdness is in some sense connected to the idea of sign, of representation. And in fact, Peirce gives us this idea of a sign. A sign or representament is a first, which stands in such a genuine triadic relation to a second, call it its object, as to be capable of determining a third, call it its interpretance, to assume the same triadic relation to its object in which it stands itself to the same object. The triadic relation is genuine, that is, its three members are bound together by it in a way that does not consist in any complexus of triadic relation. So it's interesting because uh, there are other models of, of sign. Uh, the structuralist model of sign uh, works like, uh, um, like a, 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 a sheet of paper, okay? I have in one side the sign, and the other side, the meaning of the sign. But Peirce uh, didn't use a dyadic a representation of a sign. He proposes a triadic representation of a sign. Why? Because uh, the sign is related to an object, something that is in the real world, okay? 
But how? How can I establish this connection between the sign and the object? Okay. This connection is established because the sign is able to generate an interpretant, an effect in a mind that will be exactly the same effect as if the object was presented to the, this mind. Okay. And so the sign works as a mediator between this object and the interpretant because now I can reach this interpretant through the sign and not requiring necessarily the object to be present. Okay. So uh, the sign represents this object and it represents this object in causing this interpretant to appear. Okay. So uh, this is basically the main idea of having a triadic definition of, of a sign. And uh, it's interesting because uh, using signs, we can uh, represent ideas, the elements of, of a mind. And, and basically the proposal here is to use signs to represent ideas in an artificial agent, okay? These ideas can be connected to other ideas, forming more complex ideas. These ideas can be simple or composed. They can be uh, of different types. And you see that we will be using first uh, classification of signs uh, to represent these different types of, of ideas. And uh, there are some interesting things that comes to us from Purse's ideas of first and seconds and thirds. For example, uh, these ideas, they can express different aspects of reality. For example, uh, I can think about things from the world that are just mere possibilities, things that are not happening or not happened in real. They are only imaginations, speculations, hypotheses. They could be plans that I'm uh, trying to, to, to uh, uh, investigate to use in the future. They could be some exploration of scenarios. And I, as an agent, when I have ideas of, of these kinds, uh, I know that these are just uh, uh, speculations, imaginations. I know that they are not something that coming as something that really happened in the world, okay? And these are ideas of firstness, the kind of idea that I want to represent. But I actually have uh, different kinds of ideas. I, I might have ideas that are expressing things that are really happening in the world or that really happened in the world in the past. And so, uh, it's, it's important to understand that these kinds of ideas are completely different from uh, just possibilities. Because with possibilities, I can think about a lot of things. I can think about unicorns, for example. Even though I have never seen a unicorn, a real unicorn in, 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 in the real world. Okay? But I can think about unicorns okay? because it's a, a mere possibility. But I can see things in the world and... I know that these things are happening right now, or maybe I am remembering things that happened and I know that those things really happened, okay? It's, it's interesting because uh, there are some uh, uh, problems uh, uh, with the mind when people just lose this ability of, of uh, making a differentiation between what is a fantasy or what is an imagination or what is just a, a, a speculation and what is the reality, okay? But uh, looking at Peirce, we can see that, okay, it, it's, they are different kinds of ideas, okay? The first kind is an idea of firstness. The, the other kind is an idea of, of secondness, okay? And Peirce also uh, provides us a third kind of an idea. That is the idea of loss. So I can, it's interesting because we don't see a law, you know? Uh, uh, we are looking around in the world, okay, show me a law. Uh, we, we don't have laws like this. We actually got 
uh, 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 we construct the idea of law by looking for something that happening in the actuality, okay? And then uh, looking of those things happening in the actuality or in the existence, I create some possible laws and I can have more or less uh, faith or more belief in these laws that I create. And then I can use these laws to speculate on how the future is going to, to, to happen, okay? And even laws, uh, there are different kinds of laws. For example, a category is a law, a type is a law, but a habit of behavior is also a law. Patterns that I see on, on the environment are laws. Learning algorithms are, are laws. Uh, all of them are different ideas that uh, I also would like to embed into an artificial agent in order for this artificial agent to uh, reason about the world. Okay, so uh, this is a kind of, of uh, hints that uh, using person ideas could bring us in, in the development of uh, cognitive architectures in, in artificial intelligence, okay? But ideas can also describe reality by different means, also using first and seconds and thirds. For example, I can have uh, or I can feel qualities or properties from the world. Uh, I, I do that by means of sensors and I can do, uh, I can embed these sensors in an artificial agent and the agent could be also be getting these qualities or properties from, from the world. But also it's not just properties. I, I don't talk about the world, oh, I'm, I'm having a feeling of red, a feeling of green. I, I talk about apples, I talk about grass, okay? I see things in the world, okay? At least my mind creates those ideas. And, and it's important for us to understand that an idea of thing is qualitatively different from an idea of a property because they are from different nature. A property is a firstness and a thing is a secondness, okay? And we also can have categories, categories of things, categories of qualities, and these categories are laws, okay? So they are thirdness, okay? So this gives us some hint on how to see the world. So the agent is here and the agent see a world of possibilities. The agent is able to make mental simulations of things that are happening in the world. The agent can have a, a, a some ideas that describe what is happening in the world, okay? And the agent might have also a, a loss. And so uh, we talk about the world of possibilities, the world of existence and the world of laws as three different words where we can put our ideas because these ideas are going to be of a different uh, kind. But we can have an instance of this uh, uh, with these three words, which are also firstness, seconds, and thirds, but it's in a different way, okay? Uh, we have the world of senses, the kinds of information that we can have from sensors, okay? We can have the world of things, uh, the things that we see on our environment, and we can have the world of categories that categorize both things and senses. But here, this is something that sometimes we don't realize to ourselves because we look at the world and we see things, okay? But we cannot have a direct access to these things because uh, there is no way in those things appear to us. The only thing that appear to us is through the world of senses. And then my mind, is going to integrate those things that are coming from the world of senses and saying, oh, it seems that there is an object there, an object that has those properties that you are feeling by means of the sensors, okay? And then you can uh, figure out that you see things in the world, but you see those things because, because they are in a kind of uh, uh, connection to the senses that we are feeling. In fact, 
the sensors and the actuators are our only connection to the environment. Okay, we don't have access to the things that are on the world. These things are creation of our, our mind. And uh, we can see that, for example, when we look to clouds and then I see a horse on the cloud. Okay, I, I can clearly see a cloud, a, a horse in the, in the clouds. And how is that? Because what I'm seeing is some sensory information that is coming to me. And then my mind proposes that, well, this sensory information fits very well in an idea of a horse. And then I see the horse, okay? And uh, well, I can see things that I can categorize. So uh, I am doing all those things together in, in cognition, okay? Well, Peirce has a quite sophisticated uh, classification for, for the signs, okay? He classifies a sign in relation to itself. And then uh, I can say that the sign uh, in being a quality, it is what Peirce is called a quality sign. Uh, a sign uh, being something that is in, 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 in the real world that I am presuming that it is there, if it, this is acting at as a sign, it is what Peirce calls a seen sign. And I can figure out laws. And, and if I discover a law and this law is acting as a sign, then it is what Peirce is called a legis sign, okay? And then Peirce tries to categorize the sign in relation to an object. And uh, if the sign has some kind of similarity to the, uh, to, to the object, uh, we call this sign an icon. If this sign is just a kind of uh, a drive to our attention to look at other things, uh, this sign is an index. And if the sign is not an icon or not an index, but nevertheless conveys some idea, then it is a symbol, okay? Basically, that's the idea. And then, uh, the sign in relation to the interpretant. If, if this uh, interpretant is a mere possibility, then uh, it is a ring. If this interpretant is talking about something that is happening in the world, it is a decent or decent. And uh, if it's a kind of a law that explains a kind of a reasoning, then it is an argument. Okay, that's, that's the basic idea. And then Peirce starts to make combinations of these types of, of things. So a quality sign, because it's a firstness, can only be iconic and can only be rheumatic. But a scene sign can be either an icon or an index. In being an index, it can be a rim or it can be a Dyson. So I have different kinds of combinations here that are indicated by, by those lines here. Uh, and this proposes a kind of uh, 10 different categories. If I uh, go along here, I have one, two, three, and so I can have 10 different categories, okay? Uh, we have made this, this diagram trying to uh, uh, create a representation for each of these categories. So. Uh, we have here uh, in the figure, the sign, the object, and the interpretant. And depending on uh, the sign being a firstness or a second or a thirdness, I will be uh, painting it or not. And then for example, if I have uh, the three top uh, circles painted, it's going to be a rheumatic iconic quality sign. If I have this another configuration, I have a rheumatic index cosine sign, or this another configuration is a decent indexical ledge sign. I have also made a different color scheme. So this quite white or quality signs, this with a intermediate uh, level of gray is, is a scene sign and those more uh, dark uh, uh, gray are ledge signs, okay? Um, 
well, um, and then this is where the magic starts. This is how we are trying to use these different uh, kinds of signs to be represented things uh, on the world. And in order to do that, uh, a very important issue is the notion of a sensor, because the sensor is what connects us to the reality. In fact, the sensors and actuators are the only mean by which our mind is connected to the world, okay? And uh, so we have here on the left side, the environment, and on the right side, we have the agent, okay? And we have a sensor and the sensor has some intrinsic capability of transduction. It seems that if there is a property in the world, this property is converted by the sensor as an information that could be uh, entering into the interpreter's mind, okay? And so uh, this transduction is quite important for us because uh, it is what put us in contact what we in, to, to what happens in the world. Uh, for those that have attended the, the first session today on, on, on consciousness, uh, the sensor is the responsible for giving us this notion of, of qualia. I believe that, uh, I don't remember, there was someone that uh, presented that uh, idea. And uh, well, the sensor has this uh, uh, magic, magic is not a good word, but it has this property of making this uh, ability to let us know about a property in the world, okay? And the sensor do that in two different ways. The first way is because there is a number associated to this sensor that uh, gives us the magnitude of the property or how intense this property is affecting the, 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 the agent, okay? But not just this intensity. Uh, the sensor also give us a position and an orientation because uh, imagine, for example, my hand, okay? Uh, I have uh, my hand, I can move it to different parts of, of the, the world and depending on each part of the world uh, I have my hand, I will have a different uh, information coming into my contact sensors in my skin. And then I will be having access to, to, to the properties uh, that my skin is able to, to collect from, from, from the world, okay? So this position and orientation is, is quite important for us to understand the kind of, of information that is coming from, from the sensors, okay? So these two are the signals, the, the support, the data that are going to be used internally by the agent in order to create the different kinds of signs that are going to be used to represent things in, in the world, okay? Um, so the first kind of, of um, the first kind of sign that can be created is the quality sign. The quality sign is the possibility of getting some information from a property from the world. It's intrinsic in, 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 in the sensor itself, okay? And then uh, I'm going to have a scene sign that is a scene sign of the same property because now it is the value that I am collecting from the sensor. So this is the way in which I transform a signal, some data that is coming into the, in, into the sensor and I transforming that into knowledge, okay? So this is the first part of the title of, of my presentation from signals to knowledge, okay? This is how the magic happens, okay? But then I can be transforming these signs within the interpreter mind, okay? Uh, because now I can have a second scene sign that will look at those properties and say, oh, there should be an object 
in, in, this, in this world, okay? I have a presumed existence and, and then I can make a connection to this existence that I assume that is there in, in, in the world, okay? Uh, I can also have a, a, an index and, and the interesting thing of an index at the index is going to drive my attention to something else and, and how the index do that. The index do that by changing the position and orientation of my sensor. So if I am looking in this direction and I look at an index, the index can make me move to a different point. I will move my sensor, I will move the position of my sensor, and now I will be seeing another sign, and then I can use that for creating a different kind of uh, object that is appearing in the world. So I can see things that are coming directly, but I can use indexes to move my attention to some, some, somewhere else and, and bring another idea to, to, to the interpreter's mind, okay? After doing that, I can then try to discover some law, some uh, necessity about this same object, okay? And then I have a, a, a legend sign that is going to be also created during this uh, semiotic process of generating new signs based on the old sign. So the whole process starts on sensors and sensors create signs. And then those signs it, within the agent mind could be changed and new signs are going to be created such that I can have and make sense uh, of the world, okay? Well, those, uh, so those signs uh, are, that those that are first collected by the, the sensors are icons. And PERS defines icons as signs that are connected to their objects by having some sort of similarity or analogy to them. It, and they can be of different types. They can be images uh, if they uh, share the same properties as their objects. They could be diagrams if they present in, in their components, in their parts, the same kind of affairs that we have in the real, real world. Or they can be metaphors, icons which hold in themselves another kind of parallelism, for example, some sort of analogy to their objects. And then in this particular case, when I am getting uh, a value and intensity coming from the sensor, the sensors can be understood as metaphors to the property they measure uh, because they are sharing with them the same numerical intensity as these properties. So they are in a relation of analogy to them, okay? Uh, these sensors, provide the means for directly generating iconic signs of the physical properties they measure. And the numeric measurements provided by the sensors are in a relation of direct analogy to the physical properties, okay? So by associating this number to the origin in a particular sensor, we know that this number refers to a particular physical property, which is the property the sensor is able to measure, okay? Besides that, the information regarding the sensor position and orientation provides the required data for being the substrate that turns these signals into a sign, becoming now knowledge for the agent, okay? In becoming full icons, they are put into a direct connection to the properties they represent, and this connection is ensured by the way the sensors are constructed as a transductor, okay? The second kind of... of uh, uh, sign that we can have are the indexes. And the index is a sign that is connected to the, its object by forcing the attention to a particular object different from themselves without describing it like, for example, a demonstrative or relative pronoun, uh, or in the case of a direct, direct connection between the sign and the object, we can use that for make this kind of reason, okay? These attention mechanisms are used to drive the interpreter attention to another sign, for example, uh, another icon or a symbol or even another index. And then this is how information is getting inside the, the agent and the agent is becoming a sense of, of things on the world, okay? This attention is changed by moving the sensor position and orientation. This is how the attention mechanisms actuate on, 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 on the world. 
Econs and indexes are both called natural signs because they cannot be dissociated to their object. This connection is embedded by nature, okay? Uh, and the interesting thing is that the real objects, uh, they are always inaccessible to an interpreter. The closest the interpreter can be of an object is always an icon of it. This is the best kind of information that we can get from the world. All of the rest is created just inside the mind, okay? And then, then we have uh, the 10 different classes of, of signs uh, given by Peirce. And, and, and here uh, we can have a clue on, on, on each of them. For example, the quali sign uh, is related to the possible properties of things that uh, uh, exist in the world. Then we will have the rheumatic iconic sin sign, which is, for example, some sensed property that I can get from a sensor, okay? Uh, based on this, I can also have a second rheumatic iconic scene sign, which is the gassed thing, okay? I got this uh, uh, sense of this, uh, 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 this uh, feeling of red, and then I guess at that, oh, this feeling of red is because there is an apple there, and then I can see the apple, okay? I guess a thing. Uh, then, I can have a rheumatic iconic ledge sign, which is a category, a type, a guessed law on that apple. And I say, oh, this is an apple, okay? So it's a, a, something that I already know. I have this category of apples where this particular apple is an instance. Uh, so I have a thing type. Then if the sign is uh, an index, a uh, rheumatic indexical scene sign, I can move my attention to somewhere else and I can see other things around, okay? And then I can also have a category for those uh, uh, other things around. Um, and then I can also have a symbol to describe this uh, uh, thing. For example, a word, okay? I have a word that uh, uh, refers to the same thing that this object that I, I am seeing in, in the world, okay? This is a symbolic kind of representation. Uh, I can also have a decent indexical scene sign, which is a full episode. I can, I can, I'm not just seeing an apple. I am seeing someone eating an apple, okay? This is something that is happening in, in the actuality in, in, in the world. So this is a different kind of sign. It is a decent indexical scene sign, okay? Then I can also have an episode type, and this is the decent indexical ledger sign. Further, we can have a symbol to this episode that could be represented, for example, by a sentence or a phrase in some language, and this is going to be a decent symbolic ledger sign. And finally, I can have, for example, a learning rule, a kind of inference, or, or, or something like that, that is a kind of an argument. Okay, so I can have here these 10 different classes of, of, of things in, in, in the world, okay? Well, now we have knowledge and we have different types of knowledge in the agent mind. And now we need to know how to make these knowledge turn into action. And then this is how semiosis or sign process happens. Semiosis is a process by means a sign is interpreted, generating a new sign called its interpreter. I have told about that when I presented you the, the model of what is a sign. But first, then make an examination of different kinds of interpretation. He talks about uh, genuine interpretation and degenerate kinds of interpretation. And then he proposes that there are three different kinds of interpreters the emotional interpretant, the energetic interpretant, and the logic interpretant. The emotional interpretant happens when the interpretation of the sign causes in an agent a feeling. And this is one degenerate kind of, of, of uh, interpretation. The second one is when the presence of the sign causes in the agent an action, the, the agent acts in the world. And, and, and this is how the agent starts acting 
in the world. And finally, the logic interpreter is the, the, the genuine kind of, of semiosis when a sign generates another sign and then I can have a chain of signs in the mind that is our thought, okay? But uh, it's important to, for us to understand that the path uh, uh, from knowledge to action takes place when the interpretant of the sign is an energetic interpretant. This is how uh, a sign causes an effect that is an action from the agent in, in the world, okay? Uh, then we also applying firstness, seconds, and thirdness, we can have three different kinds of energetic interpreters. Random actions, because it's firstness, okay? So they are used during exploratory behaviors. Reactive actions, so uh, uh, actions that are uh, generated by a particular set of stimuli that just generates a reaction. This is a second kind of action, which is the uh, reactive uh, actions. And we also can have a, a thirdness uh, uh, in, in action, which is the goal-based action. So uh, my action is not uh, a reaction to some stimuli, but uh, I, I am doing that because I want to achieve a future state. And so we can talk about a goal. The goal is the future state that agent is supposed to reach that is causing this, this action. We can also talk about a plan that is a representation of a set of actions which should lead the agent to its current state to the desired goal state. Okay, and, and so the agent behavior is composed of sequences of actions of these three types in order for creating the behavior for, for, for the agent. Okay, so to conclude, we can say that Person semiotics provides an extensive set of concepts for grounding cognition into a solid philosophical theory, provides many insights which might be useful for the construction of artificial intelligent agents, has a rich typology of sign types which extends far beyond standard approaches to purely symbolic artificial intelligence, also more recent approaches trying to fill the symbolic numeric gap, for example, using neural networks. We have symbols, we have indexes, we have uh, icons. Uh, and the idea is that we, if you are able to create an agent that is able to process the 10 different categories of signs proposed by first, we can say that this agent has full understanding of natural languages, sentences, and other types of communications. And in fact, there is much more than the 10 sign types. This is just the beginning, uh, just a, a kind of a, a food to our mind to, to, to let us think out of the box in order to create new kinds of artificial intelligence that could be uh, created using this uh, very uh, interesting theory that comes from uh, person semiotics, okay? And I, I conclude my, my talk here. And so I'm eventually open for, for questions. Thank you so very much. Thank you. I need Who to... would like to pose a question too? Okay, please. I don't o know how to- Open floor. I do have one little comment. The person from the previous section who was talking about similar things was Kevin Oregon, mm -hmm. but there is an interesting difference because for him, there is no focus on sensors per se. There is focus on interaction between subject and object, but in a very practical sense. Namely, remember his example with the sponge which is crucial example. You know, the sponge is not soft to a butterfly. It's very hard for a butterfly, but for you it's soft. But for, you know, an elephant it's not soft again because it's not strong enough to even be soft. So that's interaction. Actually, another philosopher, because uh, Charles Sanders Peirce is the father 
of American pragmatism, although we don't view his philosophy today as pragmatic, but another pragmatist, William James, has an idea similar to Kevin Oregon. I think actually Kevin read James and, 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 it is, and his approach is somewhat based on it or mostly in psychology. So here is the point. How would you build the bridge between James, not necessarily Kevin Orega, and Peirce in terms of the understanding of this relationship and which one is more helpful to AI or computer science, it, you think? It, it, you know, it, because it, you, you, you presented very nicely, I really love it, you know, many intricacies of James's, of uh, Peirce's idea. But so my question is twofold. Maybe connection with the more standard version of pragmatism, which was instantiated, instantiated by Kevin Oregon today. So that would be one other way to, to, to tackle this. And the second, and even clearer, it was there, but an even clearer kind of sum up on relevancy for computer science or AI or something. Well, uh, in fact, it's, it's important to, 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 to understand that Peirce and 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 uh, William James, they were uh, uh, they know each other and oh, they, yeah. they they have a lot of of uh, interaction between them. So uh, I believe that they influenced uh, each other in 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 a lot of, of ways. And uh, in fact, uh, I, I believe that in some sense they are talking about the, the same things. And and. This idea of a sensor is not exactly from Peirce. It's it's my interpretation on 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 Peirce. So okay. <laughs> I, 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 maybe I'm guilty of of, of that. Uh, but when I was talking about uh, the the sensors, uh, I was meaning not just sensors, but sensors and actuators because they are more or less uh, uh, connected together. And then we understand this notion of interaction because. Our interaction with the world is always by means of sensors and actuators. We don't have other ways of interacting uh, with the world if not by means of sensors and actuators. Okay, so uh, I, I, I in in this uh, uh, talk I, I have uh, uh, explored more the the uh, sensor part of it, but uh, of course that for acting in the world. Uh, 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 there are consequences of acting and, and, and getting a, a, a new uh, a sensor uh, uh, data. And, and, and so it's a kind of an interactive process. So we are talking about the same thing. This interaction is quite important, uh, particularly in the case of indexes, because in the case of an index, when I, I am interpreting a, an index, I am moving my attention to, to a different thing, and then I will see another thing. So I, I, I am doing some sort of interaction uh, in, with the world in order to create all those signs that are entering into a mind, okay? So uh, I would say that uh, uh, we are not too far uh, to each other, and I believe that uh, the ideas that I have presented here in some sense they uh, are aligned with the, uh, um, these uh, ideas from, from Kevin uh, in, in the past uh, session. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that we are aligned. We, we are not uh, too far from, from, from each other. Not too far at all, but the language you are using is the language from standard from robotics, yeah. from standard yeah. robotics, exactly when you talk about a robot, maybe a small one, maybe an industrial one, you know, and then you focus on the robot and the environment, not on the holistic inter integration. I don't remember whether you've been, you know, you've been almost on every bike that I've been. Have you been to Lyon that yes, Oliver yes, Georgian yes, organized? Yes, yes, I was there. Oliver was using very similar language actually on those things, also in his presentations. And Kevin was presenting very similar ideas as well. So if you were at this, yes, his keynote at the time, I think you were actually because you were on yeah. mine. He was just before me, so something. No, so, I, I was there. <laughs> yeah. So, so this was the same idea, you know, slightly different. It's called interactionism, philosophically speaking. Although it may boil down to the same thing, or not, if you talk about robotics, and or yeah. not with because I'm not an expert. I I, I would say that uh, even though uh, 
this is one of the facets of, of the problem. I, I believe that the most important thing here is how we can benefit from Peirce's idea in order to create new, uh, new kinds. For example, this idea of having uh, ideas that talk about uh, imagination, imaginary things and, and, and planning things and differentiate that from uh, what is really happened or really happened in, 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 in the world in the past. Uh, these are all kinds of ideas that could be brought from, from Peirce's ideas. And, and this is how I, I believe that uh, Peirce can be a, a, a great source of inspiration for us uh, trying to, to, to create different kinds of cognitive architectures that are implementing those things in, 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 in some way. Okay. I don't, don't you. know if I, I, I responded I correctly. I believe the... <laughs> It looks like Howard wants to answer to ask a question, so I don't want to. Monopoly. No, I, I just put my face to say hello. But sure, I have a, I have lots of questions. But I, my background of philosophy is weak, but of interest. Over the last you know years, when I've been working on my project, I'm starting to hit philosophical problems which I didn't care about before, and then become very important, like grounding problem, binding problem. If you want to build. Um, AGIs and actually implement them in software, you start hitting these problems. Um, I, I really enjoyed your talk because, again, my brain, I'm getting wave, you know, Maxwell's equations are coming into my eyes, my ears, and um, and somehow it becomes knowledge. So I, I love the philosophical part, signals to, signals to knowledge. I loved it. And um, I think my question is like, um, I, just to continue about the philosophy, I think more philosophical things, uh, we have to start dealing with them. I heard a talk that was two weeks ago by the head of MIT um, CSAIL, the head of the MIT AI laboratory, Daniela Russ, and she does work on soft robots. And she says, you know, it's not philosophical. She says, if we don't make the Young's modulus of the, uh, of the you know, I, I'm just saying the, the point is a lot of the philosophical ideas are starting to become reality. Um, I, I've heard some of the ideas here and there, like with, um, you know, the, the sandwich model of perception, you have cognition in the model and people are saying you can't have that embodiment problem. But to, to cut to the chase, a quick question is, of your whole talk, what one thing do you think is most pragmatic? What should somebody like myself, for example, both take away from this talk to work on? How can this improve my life? See, uh, I, what, what I, I felt that because it's a follow-up that I wanted to make, but he did it better. Okay. Yeah, and I, I love the talk, Ricardo. I love the talk. No, I, 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 I would say, Howard, that for example, mm -hmm. in, in the case of your model, uh, mm -hmm. when you're you're trying to to uh, create, uh, for example, a, a map of of the world, and uh, you are trying to identify uh, things that are are, are uh, in different parts of, of yes. the world. Mm -hmm. And, and, mm -hmm. and then you can use those kinds of signs to represent mm -hmm. that inside your, your, your architecture, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, instead of having uh, just uh, um, one kind of sign, if we, we figure out the, the, this very rich uh, typology of, of signs that the person offers to us, uh, you could improve, for example, your model uh, by considering uh, these differences between uh, symbols and, and icons and, and, and indexes and, and, and how they affect your judgment and, and how they drive the actions that your, your, your agent is, is able to do in, in the world. So I believe that it is possible, for example, for you to uh, try to, to look at those different kinds of signs and see, well, how I can try to see inside my architecture uh, how those things could uh, show up and, 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 and maybe you can have uh, improvements in, in your modeling for your map and, and make your map more uh, abstract and, 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 and open to different kinds of, of, of ideas inside it. So uh, uh, this is how I, I believe that those ideas could could help uh, your particular case because I know <laughs> your, your your model uh, quite well. So <laughs> I, I, I agree and thank you, Ricardo. Well, thank you. I'm good. Uh, one last thing is: is there a place we could download your slides? Will you make them available? I, I can send it to you. But but I, I can give them to to Peter uh, if it's the case, and then he okay. can uh, put somewhere. I, I don't know, Peter, if you are planning uh, doing that or not. Number one. The whole 
recording will be available, but okay, sending good. them probably to Howard directly would be the best idea. Yes, what I, I, will send, I, I will send it to you just uh, as soon as I will finish here, I, I will send it by mail. Good. And okay. by the way, we will be delighted for both presenters. I don't know whether um, we are, we have both of them to here, but uh, still, you know, to have those articles presented at the higher option of what I've mentioned, you know, on on the website, namely this journal of the Polish Academy of Science. I so I understand you have parts of it written down already, so that yeah. would be a pleasure to consider that. Okay. Thank you, uh, Howard. Thank you again. Thank you. Any more questions, please? I believe that the, the, this topic of purse is is quite uh, quite challenging because uh, it's so many ideas and and I, I myself the first time I, I start struggling with these ideas of firstness, seconds, and thirdness, I, I have a lot of trouble trying to uh, really understand uh, the meaning of, of each of those things and how they are related to this issue of having different kinds of connection between ideas. So. Uh, I, I really uh, understand that there are not so many questions here because uh, uh, at least for those that are, are not used to, to Peirce's idea, uh, these ideas are quite challenging for, for everyone to, to, to grasp and, 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 and have them in mind. But at the same time, uh, I, I got so... Uh, uh, as I, I told you, I, I am working with those things uh, from uh, 25 years, so uh, it's 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 not not so, uh, a small amount of time, and 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 it's always giving me uh, uh, ideas and and and, and uh, providing some 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 hints and and, and things. I, I think there is a question from uh, Eric uh, on on the chat. Eric He's about asking, the books, yes. Yeah, if there are books to, to understand uh, Persian semiotics, uh, Eric, uh, uh, there are a few books that uh, uh, talk a little bit about, about Perse. Unfortunately, most of them are just in Portuguese because uh, we have uh, in Portuguese uh, some researchers uh, uh, that only publish in, in, in Portuguese, which are uh, Persian scholars, uh, very well known. Um, Lucia Santaella, Winfried Nuss, uh, but there are a, a, a few uh, books uh, uh, about Peirce, and, and there is also some uh, uh, works about Peirce that uh, some excerpts of, of, of Peirce's work. Uh, it's interesting because what another problem with Peirce is that he was not able to to finish uh, his his work in 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 in, in, in publications because um, he just uh, get inside uh, his house in a farm and he started making manuscripts and uh, for most of his life uh, the biggest part of his work was unknown to the general public and uh, when he died. Uh, his daughter also uh, thought of burning all those manuscripts, uh, but uh, she get a, a, a good idea to ask uh, some people in, in, in Harvard University uh, if those manuscripts are useful for something. And when they took those manuscripts and started looking at them, they just realized that, oh, it is a very complex and an interesting kind of, of theory. And then uh, two uh, Harvard scholars, they, um, they tried to, to publish the Peirce's work and they created the collected papers of Charles Sanders Peirce. And so this was one of the first uh, publications of, of Peirce's uh, work. And then a lot uh, of people became attracted to, to this theory and, and today we have a whole school of, of philosophers that are uh, uh, quite uh, entertaining themselves in, in, in Peirce's uh, ideas. 
but uh, usually there there is not a, a, a good book that I could <laughs> I could uh, point to you because those that I know that are good are, are written in, in Portuguese. Uh, oh, let uh, me inter let me interject. It is very easy because this is you know really Paris is viewed as the first world quality, really American philosopher. There were sort of philosophers, you know, like William James, who was a politician and a philosopher, at, you know, a little bit, but but he was, you know, fully fledged philosopher really. So easy, well, probably a Google search would be as good as anything because there is plenty of stuff. Well, if you want to, to, to have a, a first, uh, first uh, contact with first, uh, I will say to you, okay, take a look on Wikipedia because Wikipedia <laughs> gives some uh, uh, introduction to first. But as I told you, uh, uh, I am not aware uh, in English, a good introductory uh, mm -hmm. book on, on, on first. Certainly there is one, but uh, I am so not aware. Of, of I, will, I will take over because on this one, because Wikipedia is all right, but definitely, uh, I always go for the online uh, encyclopedia from uh, Stanford, and this is and this is actually. Could I make a short comment, please? Of course, of course. Yes, uh, I have. Uh, I would say my background. I'm, I've been studying Perse for roughly twenty years, twenty five years, well, more on. from an evolutionary biology perspective and uh, the mathematics of evolutionary biology. Uh, searching for ideas and approaches that were more relevant. The motivation for studying Peirce has been the fact that he was a chemist by training, uh, the first American to get a degree in chemistry from Harvard. Uh, and as such, he frequently references chemical thought uh, in his writings uh, throughout, and his works on graph theory he attributes directly to, to chemical thought. So it, it, uh, if one is seriously interested in Peirce uh, from a scientific perspective, I, I think it is essential that one try and somehow, some way, in some shape or fashion or form, relate uh, his notions of, uh, his philosophical notions also to the status of the history of chemistry at that time. And chemistry is going under very rapid development between the period of 1860, when the atomic table was uh, being formed or formatted, if you would, and uh, in 19 by 1910, uh, the relationship between chemistry and electricity uh, had been well developed. And uh, there, so, my con summary and conclusion is there is a close relationship uh, between the development of CSP's uh, Charles Saunders Peirce's thought and the history of chemistry and the history of logic. And those are so in intertangled and intertwined and interrelated that uh, it really is an effort to try and separate things out. Thank you for the opportunity to, to give an opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. I, I, I recognize your name from the Purcell list. I believe that you have made some contributions to, to this list, at least in, in, in the past. Um, it's interesting what you said because uh, uh, Peirce has this, uh, he, he called it a science that uh, is called phaneroscopy. And uh, phaneroscopy was uh, uh, an idea of, from Peirce that, uh, in some sense, he was trying to think about ideas connecting to each other, just like chemical uh, atoms or creating uh, chem uh, uh, chemical uh, mole molecules. And, 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 and so, uh, the beginning of, of Peirce's uh, thought about, about semiotics started from this resemblance that he was able to uh, uh, get that, okay, maybe how uh, ideas connect to others in, in the mind, they could be uh, in some sense similar to how uh, uh, molecules and atoms uh, bind together and, and, and form connections together. And, and this was in, 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 the, in the background on how uh, uh, Peirce developed his uh, theory of, of, of science. It's so it's uh, quite interesting to, to, to notice that this origin uh, uh, of semiotics in phaneroscopy 
uh, is is uh, quite remarkable and it, it's a clear inspiration on on chemistry yeah you're right Thank uh, you. one, one footnote to add to that and that is that he never really accepted the modern notion of uh well, I just put put it in the simpler language. The role of electricity was not clear in chemistry. He understood valence and he understood atoms as being firstness, if you would, uh, but he was not able to bridge that gap to how molecules are formed. And he followed pretty much the Descartian view of the vertex notion of atoms. And so uh, it's very complicated to approach from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. But my question is, you posed a very interesting topic. Aren't you the right person to write about it? Or do you have something unpublished? Because as I was talking to Ricardo, we have a block of papers at the journal Philosophy and Science of the Polish Academy of Science. And we definitely would welcome a paper to go with Ricardo's, you know, connected to uh, pairs. Plus, uh, he's, you know, you know, plus they are very open actually to those interdisciplinary things. It doesn't have to be just philosophy or just computer science. So you would be a decent fit, very good fit actually. Uh, it, uh, I will give serious consideration to the thought. I have published a paper in the, the journal called Information, mm -hmm. uh, which yes. introduced some of Peirce's ideas into uh, relational mathematics or a, a modified view of category theory. Mm -hmm. So uh, I yes, I've published several, several things in the area. I've never brought it together to look at it completely from the Persian perspective. Good. So that would be a try. I might actually, I, I am actually on the board of the journal. So very good. And yeah, information is a very decent journal. So that's a good recommendation as well. So you are very welcome. I think our deadline, you can see my name and or Ricardo's and send us this. I think our deadline would be October, but we can late October or something like that. But of course, if this is too, too soon, you know, we can definitely be in touch because that would be very helpful. Doesn't have to be particularly short or particularly long, but you've got us interested in your in your little presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, please? If not, thank you, everybody.